and welcome to the Spectrum Show. Coming up, I look at the news and top selling games from November 1987. I shout at my Spectrum, right you fool, I play some older games, look at a newer title, and do some other stuff. But first, the news. Adverts are now appearing for Amstrad's anticipated new Spectrum, the Plus 3. Focusing mainly on the disk drive of the machine, there is very little else mentioned other than the 128K of memory. The price is £199, with the older Plus 2 being sold alongside it for £139. The PCW show brought thousands of people together, 75,000 to be exact, all looking to see the new technology and games. A lot of companies were in attendance including Ocean, Sinclair, Firebird, Activision and US Gold. There were a lot of new titles on display too including Bangkok Knights, International Karate Plus, Super Hang On, Rampage, Outrun and many more. US Gold have signed a deal with TSR, the producers of the popular board game Dungeons and Dragons. US Gold hoped to produce as many as 10 titles from that license including not only adventure style games, but also arcade based games. The deal with Strategic Simulations Incorporated, who owns the license for the franchise, is claimed to be, by US Gold, the software license of the decade. The popular television show, Treasure Hunt, not popular because of the format, but mainly because of Annika Rice's bottom, is to be converted into a computer game by DeMarc. There are no specific details yet, but there are a lot of young boys eager to get a glimpse of that famous rump. And now on to the top selling games. Riding high in the charts this month are Light Force, a classic shooter from FTL, Commando, the arcade clone from Elite, Head Over Heels, isometric fun from Ocean, Whizball, a challenging game from Ocean, and Game Over. Arcade action from Imagine. And that was the news and top selling games from November 1987. Ladies and gentlemen, I bring to you Micro Command. This wonderful device from Orion Data has been on my radar for some time and has been in my collection for a few months now. It was first mentioned in computer and video games in January 1984, with adverts appearing soon after. The unit sold for $49.95, which was quite a sum for 1984, but it did promise a sensational advance in computer game technology. You talk, your computer obeys. Inside the large box you will find two manuals, the additional information booklet, which tells you how to use the micro command in your own basic programs, and the micro command user manual, which talks you through setting it up, calibrating it, and tells you about the games, but more about that later. There is a tape containing the various programs, a large and quite heavy interface, and a cheap plastic microphone. Once plugged into the Spectrum, you plug the microphone into the top, load the tape and wait for a while. Eventually you get the calibration screen, which starts you off with just two words, up and down. I messed this up the first time so I had to start again. It was very sensitive to tone, as we shall see. Once you have said the word four times, the interface picks it up and the game starts. Using the two words, you answer the prompts on screen to make two men climb up or down the ladders towards guns so that they can shoot the aliens. Up. Down. Not very exciting, is it? But I suppose it's just a demo. Up. Here is where we see the first Down. issue. It sometimes gets things wrong, or more importantly, you do, 
depending on how you say the words. Without knowing, because the game is going badly, or well, you tend to change the pitch of your voice. And this messes with the micro command. Down. 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 If you manage to finish this with a high enough percentage, the next stage begins and another two words are added, so you now have to learn up, down, left and right. You go through the calibration again, and then it's on to the game, this time with four men. Left. Right. Again, controlling the men with your voice is tricky, and you have to score 80% accuracy before you can move on to something else. Something which I never managed, despite trying several times. Right. Left. To be honest, it soon became boring shouting things into the microphone when you were just itching to press a key. Bacon. Aardvark. Remember though, this is a spectrum, so don't expect miracles. To get into the next game, I had to break into the basic program and just load it over the top. The game, called Sheep Talk, allows you to control a sheepdog trying to round up sheep. Yes, it's about as exciting as it sounds. It's a very slow, boring game written in basic that doesn't really do the unit justice. Barking, and forgive the pun, commands at the screen results in little progress. Right, you fool. If you manage to get 100%, on the second game, the one with four men, you can join the Micro Command 100 Club. Sounds ominous, but all you get are some newsletters. Left. Up. The device can hold up to 15 words, and can be set to slow or fast mode for your own games. Slow mode is more accurate, but fast mode is often required for fast paced games, obviously. Full details and listings of the machine code routines are in the additional information guide. Come on Rover, go get them. Up. Up. Oh no. One of my sheep has drowned. I couldn't find any right. commercially available games for the unit, which is right. probably why it vanished into oblivion. Right. A brave attempt to bring speech right. recognition to the spectrum, considering we've only really mastered it for the consumer market Down. with things like Siri and Cortana Down. in the last few years. Down. With a desperate lack of games, this can Left. just be classed as a bit of fun, really. Left. Oh, what a stupid game. This is Aquarius, released by Bugbyte Software in 1983. It's an early game, as you can probably tell, and sets you as a commander of a frogman team out to destroy death machines hidden underwater by evil governments around the world. Before the game starts, it displays a secret code required to destroy the machines should you be lucky enough to ever get there. And it's important that you remember this. Then it's into the water. To get to these machines, you have to first navigate the dangers of the ocean. Things like jellyfish, sharks and mines. You're armed with a spear gun, luckily, and you can use this to clear your way. You do have a limited amount of oxygen too, but this can be replenished by collecting tanks thoughtfully left at the bottom of the screen. The inlay doesn't mention these, I found them by accident. The screen scrolls rather jerkily from right to left, and your frogman can move in all directions. Jellyfish, sharks and mines appear randomly, and you have to either avoid them or shoot them. Jellyfish and mines just float about. Octopuses move straight towards you, and sharks swim across the screen, turn around and then head back. This keeps going until you get to the caverns. Once there, the game becomes like scramble, really, with things that shoot vertically and electric force fields to deal with.
Once you get to the death machine, which is pretty unimpressive, you enter the secret code by shooting the correctly coloured blocks. And then it all starts again. The graphics are very basic with limited animation, and it certainly looks like an early game. That said, it's a challenge to play. Sound is used sparingly with beeps when you fire, hit something or die. If you can get over the bland graphics, there's a decent game in there. Not bad for a quick challenge, really. Arguably, one of the most notable and recognisable arcade racing games is Outrun. Fast-paced action, cool graphics and great soundtrack. Converting this to the 8-bit spectrum would certainly be a challenge. This is Outrun, released by US Gold in 1987. In case you have never seen this, or any arcade style racer, the idea is to drive very fast. And that about sums up most racing games. This is a time based racer though with checkpoints. As you reach each checkpoint, the timer resets with any spare time added on. The graphics change and the gameplay gets harder. Each checkpoint has a choice, left or right, although it's difficult to tell in this game when you actually reach one. Left is the easier option, and right is the harder option. On to the game then. Well, I'm not sure whether this is just me or not, but it looks like it's running in slow motion, at least compared to the arcade. The graphics are nice, monochrome instead of full colour, quite detailed, but the whole game feels to be running at half speed. The trackside objects are few and far between, and the other vehicles just seem like splodges on the screen. The track moves up and down to give the impression of hills and valleys, and it does sweep left and right. But it's like a slow motion car crash, which often happened in this game. The music is nice on the 1 to 8 machine, but you do have the option to play the real arcade music on the provided bonus tape. Sadly, I couldn't find any way to switch off the game music, so there is little in the way of engine sounds, just screeches when you go around corners or crash. Because of the game speed, the controls seem very slow in response, and can cause you to end up in the back of a lorry or arguing with a tree. Once you slow your brain down and match the game speed, not only does the game play a little better, but you are now also fully qualified to be a project manager. A good attempt then by US Gold, but somehow, after playing the arcade version, this one seems pedestrian. I managed to get to the first checkpoint once, after about 30 minutes of playing, and then proceeded to crash into almost everything. Not a bad racing game, once you've slowed your brain functions down, but certainly not the best. This is Valation, released by TARDIS Remix in 2016. This superb looking game has you trying to escape from an enemy complex without dying, and also destroying their ships and lasers where required, which is more or less everywhere. After some great music, you are thrown into the game, and quickly realise this is very much based on Cybernoid. You control your ship, which has gravity, meaning you're always stabbing the up key to keep lined up with exits and corridors. The first set of screens has things you can't destroy, so it's a matter of manoeuvring around them. Later on though we get things to shoot, 
and of course things that shoot back. There are also missiles that launch upward, very much like Scramble, and yet more hazards await further into the game. As you can see, the graphics are superb, very well drawn and very colourful. Sound is used well too, although things can be quiet for periods of time while you plan your route. Control is crisp, which is a good thing, meaning tight navigation of walls and aliens is, although not easy, at least not the failure of the game. The gameplay for me was a little bit tricky to start with, and sometimes unforgiving, but the more you play, the further you get. In places you have to be pixel perfect to get through, and this can lead to some frustration initially, but for good players this will be a nice challenge. Practice and patience pays off in this game though, and it'll keep you coming back for more. A great game then, definitely check this one out. When the Spectrum was released way back in 1982, like so many other systems at the time, the first games to be available were arcade clones. This helped to get the gamers on board, take them away from the dark arcades and into the shops to spend some money. One of the very first games that I bought was Gobbleman from Arctic Computing. As you can probably tell from the title and the inlay, this is a Pac-Man clone. Inlays of early Arctic games tended to be very good, and this one still looks good today. On to the play then, and this 8K game tries to replicate the arcade, but because sprites were still not commonplace on the Sinclair machine back then, the author opted to use 8x8 pixel character blocks, and user-definable graphics. Although they look similar to the arcade counterpart, because of the size, they don't have the same attraction. Movement too is in 8 pixel jumps, rather than single pixel smooth transition. The maze is much larger too, taking up the full screen, consisting of the usual blue walls and red dots, with power pills at each corner. There are no gates on each side of the screen to take the player across to the opposite side though. The ghosts are less intelligent, or individual than the arcade, as you'd expect from an 8K game, but they do the job well, offering decent gameplay. Sound is limited to blips when a dot is eaten, and of course the death sound. The death routine though, where our little yellow friend rolls back on himself, is missing. Instead we get a random jumble of ASCII characters. The bonus items are also missing, meaning it's just a dash around the maze. Control is fine, and the gameplay delivers a basic version of the game, that can still be challenging. So what we have here then is a run-of-the-mill arcade clone, that has most of the elements, but due to the limitations of the machine, and the knowledge of programming at the time, provides a kind of minified version. You do get a decent game out of it, as long as you don't mind the jerky graphics. So, oh, do we need intros and outros? No, I don't think so. Right. It's easy just to, to go into it. That's is a more of a natural conversation than... Yeah, I agree. The So the shops topic was yours, wasn't it? It was, and I, and I don't know why, because I've only got one good story about shops. <laughs> go on then, let's hear it. <laughs> um, it was in a place called Morley, near Leeds, where I used to live. And I used to go to this computer shop every Friday, straight from work. And one, one day we went in. And the guy said, I've, I've got something really exciting for you. You won't believe what I've got. And he put this tape on. And it, the shop was only small. It was about the size of a small bedroom. You could get about five or six people in. And it was, that was it. So I started this tape going. And the usual loading sounds came on. And it was crackling away. And the loading screen came up for Bandersnatch. You're kidding me. Which, <clears throat> no, no. And uh, and we all sort of stood there open-mouthed. And he said, yeah, it's great, isn't it? He said, you just wait till you see the game. It's brilliant. So we're all stood there waiting. And right at the end of it, I heard um, the tones and I thought, that sounds familiar, what the hell is that? And the game finished loading and up popped on the monitor, Manic Miner. 
And there were six of us all stood there, open mouthed, just waiting for this game to load, talking about it. This is going to be great. We're going to be the first people to see it. And then Manic Miner popped up. Brilliant. I remember the way you could work out the game. You knew what game was loading by the tone. You would learn to recognise certain pieces of tone when a game was loading. If you heard them again, you knew what was coming. Yeah, there's, there are some that are really easy to pick out as well. And one of them, 3D Tanks, I don't know if it was done de- deliberately, but if you listen to the loading screen, when it fills in the colours, it actually plays, and I think it's Rule of Britannia, the Hello. first few bars of it. <laughs> I'll have to go back and, uh, yeah. and listen. Are you sure? Yes. Could you do definitely. that deliberately? How would you do that deliberately? I don't, I don't know. If it is, I'd be amazed. That's really, really clever. I, mm. I loved the Manic Miner loading screen, mentioning that. the it was well, so, with the, with the flashing attribute. Yeah, it was so simple and so quick compared yeah. to other loading screens. Anyway, back to shops. Yeah. So I suspect that I suspect the the shops had a lot of empty boxes as well because in the early days they used to have the tapes out in the recorders next to the machines. Yeah. And there's a lot of uh, youths who would have gone in and stolen those, like, inst- and, and then type rude messages on the screen as, as everybody did. Yeah. <laughs> and give it some scroll. <laughs> the other shop I really remember was one in Sunderland, and it was an independent. And I used to go there. It was probably about. 86, 87, so it was a few years later, and I, I used to, I just used to spend all my pocket money there, I'd save up, um, and every time I could, I'd saved up enough to buy a game, I used to jump on the bus to Sunderland, go in there, go in that shop, and see what was, uh, what was about. I bought loads of games from that shop, and every time you bought a game, you got a raffle ticket, mm. and if you're, you got a free game, if your raffle, t- raffle ticket got drawn... So I'd end up going there two weeks in a row. Now, I never had enough money saved up in one week to get another game. So I'd go there right. one week, buy buy a game, go there the next week just to see if my raffle ticket had come up. I never won. I never, I never, my raffle ticket never came up. I'm bad at it. <laughs> <laughs> it was probably never, ever drawn. It was just there to entice you into buy. That's no, they had, they had it. They had it. They had actually had the winning ticket. Unless they picked the oh. winning ticket from one that hadn't been given out. Mm. So... But the problem is you had to go in the next week. It was gone mm. by the week after, and if you hadn't claimed it, you'd lost it. So it used to get oh, me going. Right, and I think it was yeah, it was kind of a loyalty thing. Um, yeah, yeah. I think there were the, there were two types of of shops for computers in those days. There was the small independent ones that mm. were like the one I used to go in was really tiny, and then there, there were there were larger ones like Lasky's and Smiths and Boots and all that, where you just had shelves and shelves and shelves of of games that were there forever. Yeah. And and sadly, it seemed to be the, the small independents that, that disappeared. I don't think they could keep up with, with the demand because the back end of, and I wouldn't say the back end of the spectrum, but as things were slowing down, the, the independents just didn't stock all the latest titles. And I remember trying to buy Mooncrester from them and then they never had it in it. It had been released at least a week and I, and I knew of another shop. I think it was Lasky's or something that actually had it on the shelf, but I wanted to be loyal to this shop and I waited for them to get it in and they never got it in. So I eventually went out and bought it from Boots or something. And, you know, three or four months later, it was just worse and worse. And then eventually they just they just shut down. They just I don't know what it was. I don't know whether they didn't have a sale or return policy or whatever, you know, with the distributors. But yeah. It was a shame because they, they were the people that knew exactly what you were talking about. They were enthusiasts as well. You know, it's, it's a shame that all the small independents have gone. It is. Um, yeah, you don't get them at all anymore to use now things have come mind everything even even the chain stores even game and places like that starting to struggle with it's all just digital download now isn't it yeah yeah, yeah. oh i remember digital download on the spectrum we got it first with um at micronet 800 <laughs> yeah we beat them to it digital downloads nothing new there <laughs> <laughs> except except it's quicker now probably I don't know. If you get something on the Xbox and it's like megabytes and megabytes, it takes ages. And then the thing has to update every single time that you put it on. That's true. Yeah, there's no updating. I've got nothing else about shops, I don't think. I don't think I have um, either. Um, very, very short one, but we... <laughs> we digressed on it. Well, putting the digressions in. Probably... Yeah, we can put the digressions yeah. in. Yeah, yeah. <laughs>
it's been a while since I last looked at some Spectrum demos, so I thought it's about time to see what's new. There are always plenty of new demos being released, and the ones that caught my eye this time included Rainbow by GDC. This nice demo has some great music and brilliant graphics. I wasn't so keen on the low-res parallax scrolling. Plasmas are always good, and the use of colour is excellent. But I did like the human head with colour washes. A good all-round demo then. The next one is called Into the Future by Huey Program. This is a great demo, and very unconventional. It tells the story of what we all wanted in the future, and does this using excellent music and a mixture of visuals that express the story. There are some nice images, ranging from digitised pictures to attribute blocks. There's a light scattering of humour, and Jetman. Not that that had any effect on my judgement, of course. This is a great way to spend a few minutes. And there are plenty of more demos out there, all waiting to be explored. Go grab a few now. May the 20th and 21st saw Warsaw play host to Retro Revival 2017. I hadn't attended this event before, but had heard good things about it, so after arranging to meet Jeff there, I finally got in, and was able to experience it for myself. The room was smaller than I expected, but was packed with arcade machines, consoles and computers. There was also a separate room for pinball tables. I think the event attracted more people than it could hold, because at times it was really packed out, meaning it was difficult to get onto the arcade machines. The arcade machines themselves were all free play, with some classics like Turbo Outrun, Robotron and Donkey Kong, as well as some rather obscure ones like Ice Cold Beer, a mechanical game that attracted quite a few people. There were also many stalls selling games, including a lot of Spectrum titles that I was tempted to buy. I also met up with Matt Dolphin, the guy who did the Vidi ZX review for episode 47, and he very kindly gave me some free games. Thanks, Matt. Chris Wilkins from Fusion Retro Books was also there, selling a lot of his wares, and somehow I was persuaded to help with his next Kickstarter project. More of which you'll no doubt get to hear about soon, if you don't already know. I caught up with the Retro Asylum guys who were hosting several excellent talk sessions, with the likes of Dave Perry, Gremlin Graphics, Rare, and the Spectrum God Jim Bagley. I was persuaded to sit on the panel for the Spectrum Next Talk too, along with Jim, and thoroughly enjoyed it. It was standing room only, and I think everybody really enjoyed that 40 minutes of Spectrum chat. After a quick burger, it was back into the main room for more gaming. Overall, it was an excellent day, and had I not been recovering from a cold at the time, I would have been back for the Sunday session. It was more intimate than the larger events like Replay Manchester, the talks were held away from the main area, which was better, and it focused on retro, rather than other tat like modern consoles, cosplay and network gaming. I hope they hold it next year, and expand it. There were certainly crowds that would fill the extra space. 